The Discovery of the Planets In an attempt to understand the will of the gods, the priests of Mesopotamia studied the stars. After first establishing the constellations, the Mesopotamian astronomers discovered special stars which wander from one constellation to the next. The Greeks would rather call these stars planets, meaning wanderers. The earliest references to the planets go back all the way to the 3rd millennium BC, when they are mentioned in horoscopes. Most of our knowledge of Mesopotamian astronomy comes from the ancient library of Nineveh from the 7th century BC, where over 30,000 clay tablets were discovered. Among these texts was the Venus tablet, which documents when Venus first and last appeared above the horizon, over a period of 21 years. And the Mullapin, a tablet from the same library, gives estimates for the appearance and disappearance of all the planets visible to the naked eye. In the Persian period, it was even established how long it takes for the planets to move through the zodiac and also between two conjunctions with the sun. And finally, we'll take a look at the Egyptian depictions of the planets, which are more rare, but very interesting nonetheless. So we have a lot to get to. Let's start. Hey, good to see you. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. On this World History Channel, we'll trace humanity's relentless pursuit of scientific truth, moral excellence and enlightenment. You'll meet anyone from Mesopotamian astronomers and Indian yogis to Greek philosophers and enlightenment scientists. And you'll meet them firsthand using primary sources, giving you valuable insights that transcend the surface level understanding you get on other channels. So go check it out for yourself. Let's start. The earliest references to the planets go back all the way to the 3rd millennium BC. Interestingly, what most people don't know is that the planets are actually very easy to spot. In fact, you can see them on most clear nights, even in light polluted cities. Especially Venus and Jupiter are bright, even brighter than your average star. Here for instance we see an image of the crescent moon, and next to it Venus. On the top we see Jupiter, and if you look very closely you can see Mercury near the horizon as well. And as you can see, the stars here aren't even visible. There are two ways to distinguish the planets from the stars. Firstly, because they are much closer to us than the stars, they do not flicker as much. And secondly, although this takes some time, if you wait a few days, the planets have wandered relative to the fixed stars. In these early days, the names of the planets appeared in horoscopes. For instance, a fragmentary example from 2300 BC reads, When the planet Venus, and then the tablet is damaged, and it continues, an omen of Sargon, of the king of the four quarters. And a fragment from around 2000 BC reads, When the planet Jupiter turns his face, when rising towards the west, and you can see the face of the sky, and no wind blows, then there will be famine and disaster will rule. So clearly a horoscope, connecting the positions of the planets with events on Earth. By studying the motions of the planets, the Mesopotamians believed that they could read the will of the gods. And as a result, they called the night sky the Book of Heaven. The astronomers were set the task of reading this book to figure out how to best serve the gods in order to receive their praise and more importantly, to avoid their anger. The greatest source of astronomical knowledge for Mesopotamia was found in the Royal Library of Nineveh where a staggering 30,000 tablets on various topics were discovered. In 612 BC, the city Nineveh was destroyed and its library was burned. But unlike the famous Library of Alexandria in Egypt, where all papyri scrolls were lost, the clay tablets at Nineveh were made even tougher by the fire. In fact, those tablets were hardened in the oven after writing to make them stronger. The library was founded by the Assyrian philosopher king Ashurbanipal, 
who ordered his servants to collect texts from all around Mesopotamia for his library. We read, the rare tablets on your route that are not found in Assyria, seek them out and bring them to me. A marvelous tablet from this library with horoscopes is called the Venus Tablet of Amisaduka, which was written in the 17th century BC. It is the oldest known astronomical text. The text gives a systematic compilation of omens drawn from the dates on which Venus first and last appears above the horizon over a period of 21 years. And aside from that, the text also contains divinations about floods, the availability of food, the outcome of wars, and so on. For instance, we read, In the month Arasamna, on the 11th day, Venus disappeared in the east. Two months and an unknown number of days it stayed away in the sky. And in the month Tibeti, on an unknown day, Venus became visible in the west. Then the harvest of the land will prosper. The library of Nineveh also contained a copy of the Enuma Anu Enlil, which was composed at some point in the second millennium BC. And this text contained about 7,000 omens written on 70 tablets. And these omens were based on observations of eclipses, the phases of the moon, the positions of stars, the sun, the moon and the planets, and more. Over time, it came to be believed that each planet was animated by a god. Venus became associated with the goddess Inanna, the goddess of fertility, love and war. The sun was associated with the god Shamash, who ruled heaven and earth. The moon became equated with the god Sin, and this god was associated with the bull, perhaps because the crescent moon resembles the horns of a bull. Mars was associated with the god Nergal, the lord of the dead. And Mars was often related to invasion, plague and disease. Possibly because of its red color, the color of blood. Jupiter was related to Marduk, and he was sometimes depicted as a spade, since Marduk was seen as a builder of cities. And this planet often signified good harvest, peace and security. One of the main tasks of the celestial gods of the Mesopotamians was to decide fate, which they wrote down on a magical clay tablet called the Tablet of Destinies. It was believed that as long as the supreme god Enlil controlled this tablet, the universe was in order. Various planets became associated with this tablet. Saturn was equated with the hero Ninurta, whose symbol was the eagle, and who was believed to be the guardian of the tablet. And Mercury was associated with Nabu, the god of scribes, and as a result his symbol was often the cuneiform wedge, the unit of writing of the Mesopotamians. We read that when the gods assembled to decide the fate of the world for the next year, it was this god Nabu who recorded it on the tablet. And Nabu was also considered to be the messenger of the gods, similar to the Roman god who is actually called Mercury. And this is likely a reflection of the rapid motion of the planet Mercury as compared to the other planets. Mesmerized by their discovery of these planets, the Sumerians often depicted them in their art. Venus was often symbolized by an eight-pointed star, the moon by a crescent, and the sun by an equal-armed cross. Here, for instance, we see a king in the middle who presents his daughter to a god. And above them, we see in order Venus, the eight-pointed star, the crescent moon, and the sun. And on this particular cylinder seal, which you can roll over clay to make this image, you see a depiction of Venus as a six-pointed star and again the crescent moon. And here we see from left to right a winged sun, the eight-pointed Venus star, the crescent moon, and all the way to the right we see the Pleiades star system. And possibly the wedge and the spade next to the Pleiades represent Jupiter and Mercury. And in various cases, kings depicted themselves wearing the symbol of the sun around their necks, demonstrating their connection to this divine sphere. 
And above this particular figure, by the way, we see an order from left to right. Symbols for Venus, a thunderbolt, then the crescent moon, the winged sun, and finally the crown of the sky god, Anu. And on this boundary stone from the 12th century BC, we recognize beside a number of constellations, which I've discussed in the previous videos, also a number of planets. We see the moon, the sun, Venus, Jupiter as a spade, Mercury as a cuneiform wedge, and here also Mars as a panther. The priests of Mesopotamia were also the first to explicitly state that the moon, the sun and the planets all passed through the same band in the sky. And this band in which the 12 constellations are located is now known as the zodiac. Here for instance we see the moon moving from the constellation Taurus to Gemini. And here we see Venus and the moon located within the twin constellation. And here we see four planets and also the sun, which is located just below the horizon, all on the same line. And the plane in which these planets move is now called the ecliptic. And it is now recognized as the plane of our solar system in which all the planets revolve around the sun. The ecliptic was first described in a text called the Mula Pin, which was also found in the library of Nineveh and which was probably created around 1000 BC. It consists of two tablets that contain a summation of all astronomical knowledge that was available at the time. On the tablet, for instance, we find a complete list of the Mesopotamian zodiac, as discussed in the previous lecture. And the text also calls the zodiac the path of the moon, and then goes on to explain that the sun and the other planets also move along this path as we've just discussed. And in this text, the astronomers also wrote down how long all the visible planets appear above and below the horizon, thus allowing them to roughly predict their future positions. And in the text, we also read about the seasons, the equinoxes, that is the days when day and night are of equal length, and also the solstices that are the shortest and the longest days of the year, it tells about the visibility of the moon, the changing length of the day, the changing length of shadows during the year, and more. As time went on, the astronomical knowledge of the Mesopotamians became more and more impressive. Around 500 BC, the Neo-Babylonians discovered that 235 lunar months, so 235 rotations of the moon around the Earth, neatly coincides with 19 solar years. And if we divide 19 years by 235 months, we can find the lunar month only seconds apart from its modern value. So this was a really accurate observation. And around the same time, the Mesopotamians also discovered the Saros cycle of 223 lunar months, which is about 18 years after which the sun, the earth and the moon return to roughly the same configuration. And as a result, chances are high that eclipses recur after this interval. The eclipse of the sun was especially seen as an important and dangerous message from the gods. It was perceived as a direct attack by the gods on the king. In fact, for the king to be able to stay safe, they believed, he had to be replaced by a temporary substitute who was then sacrificed in his stead. We read, Dumki, who had ruled Assyria, Babylonia and all the countries, died with his queen as a substitute for the king. He went to his destiny for their rescue. And we prepared a burial chamber. He and his queen have been decorated, treated, displayed, buried and wailed over. The burnt offering has been burned, all omens have been cancelled, and numerous rituals, ceremonies, exorcistic rites, chants and scribal recitations have been performed in perfect manner. And this all to prevent the perceived anger of the gods with an eclipse. 
The Persians, who became the dominant force in Mesopotamia from the 6th century BC, are credited with the discovery of the synodic and the sidereal periods of the planets. Let me explain. The synodic period is the time between consecutive conjunctions of a planet with the Sun. So how long does it take for a planet to catch up with the Sun? That is the synodic period. And the sidereal period is the time that it takes for a planet to pass through the entire 12 signs of the zodiac. And as an example, they knew for instance that Saturn has a sidereal period of 29.5 years. And two of those periods are equal to about 57 synodic periods. And these figures were known for all the visible planets. Quite an accurate result. We know relatively little about Egyptian astronomy, mostly because they wrote on papyrus, which perishes in time. What we do have is an astronomical design on the ceiling of the tomb of Senemnut, who was possibly a lover of Hatshepsut and who is dated to about the 15th century BC. In the top half of this image, we see depictions of Venus, Jupiter and Saturn, and also the star Sirius and the constellation Orion. And all but Venus are symbolized as gods floating in boats. And in the lower half, we see 12 circles representing the 12 months. And each circle is cut into 24 parts, representing the 24 hours of the day, which was an Egyptian invention. Finally, let's quickly look ahead to the Greeks. The purpose of the Mesopotamian astrologers had always been to read the will of the gods. And as a result, there was little motivation to go beyond a mere description of the motion of the planets. But for the Greeks, this was no longer enough. They wanted a rational, naturalistic mechanism to explain why the planets moved the way they did. But this is a topic for another time. And there we have it, the discovery of the planets by the Mesopotamians. I hope you were inspired by this lecture. And if you want to know more about ancient astronomy or any other topic from world history, then read my book In Search of the Sublime. You can read it completely for free on worldhistorybook.com or you can buy a physical copy on Amazon. See you next time. Bye bye.